Welcome to each of you. Are you ready to travel? Have your seatbelts fastened? All right. We're going to go tonight to a lovely, lovely city. It seems that when men after the Dark Ages took a renewed interest in the arts and sciences, sculpting and painting and writing, that renewed interest, now known as the Renaissance, happened largely in and around this city. We're going to Florence. We've said so many times the major cities of the world are born on the banks of a river. In Paris, it's the Seine. And uh, in London, it's the Thames. Here it happens to be the Arno. And this is a shot of downtown Florence. You can see several bridges across the Arno River. There's one in particular that we're going to talk about and visit in just a little bit. But let me tell you about my appreciation for the style of the city. It's hundreds of years old, of course. But there has been a city statute that says that the buildings, homes or businesses in the downtown area, now, of course, that stretches for miles, must be of a cream-colored stucco on the outside and must have burnt orange tile roofs. And it makes this city unique. In my mind, it makes it look clean and neat and somehow organized. So let's get down then and have a close-up of the city. From this panoramic view, I shall point out to you the three major places that we're going to visit. So go to the extreme right hand and the upper of the screen, and there we see the tower of the Medici Palace. That tower had a very famous occupant. We're going to talk about him. And that's where we're going to begin in just a little bit, at the Medici Palace and Tower. And then we're going to go to this building. That is the second largest Catholic cathedral in the world. That is the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And after visiting there, we're going to end up visiting over at this cathedral. This is the Cathedral of um, Santa Croce, or the Holy Cross. A good way to see the town without a lot of expense is to get aboard the Florentine taxi. There it is. But because we need the exercise and because it's a very short distance from here to where we want to go, we're going to just walk. And we find ourselves then in front of the Medici Palace. And I want you to notice a couple of things. Firstly, you see a lot of folks gathered around. You see bleachers. And this picture is, of course, taken at night. This was taken at the time of the Florentine Rodeo. Now, we're used to rodeos and horse races and all of this part of the world, aren't we? We have bull riding and barrel races and um, bucking bronx and, and bareback and all of that sort of thing. Here, it's quite different. It begins with five days of imbibing alcoholic beverages. And that's putting it mildly. And when everyone is pretty well drunk, then they ribbon off several streets throughout the city, this direction and that, and over here and over there and there and there. And that is the racetrack. And then they bring out their cowboys, who are now well oiled. <laughs> and they put them on the backs of these wild broncs. And the first guy to get around and through, and there are folks watching their every step and every movement, the first guy to get through this obstacle course and back to the point of beginning is the winner of a large purse and he becomes the hero, the all-around cowboy of Italy. Nearly every year there are some who are seriously injured, either riders or spectators or both, and oft times there are some who lose their lives, but they continue on with the Florentine Rodeo. Now, I want you to next notice the style of the architecture of the building. You will see that this palace is about four and a half stories in height, and at the roof level, there is a cantilever with arches right across there. An overhang. Now, we have overhangs over our roofs here in this part of the country and in other places of the world, of course, especially where there's a lot of rain or snow, whatever. But the overhang here was for a different purpose. The cantilever has these arches which are open to whatever's below. <clears throat> there were enemies of the Medici, and of course, 
they're political enemies of any ruling family or any government, I suppose for that matter. And so they had bars and shutters over the windows and they were able to make the doors quite secure. But if someone really began to batter and was determined to break in, then the defenders up on the roof, and this is 24 hours around the clock, they had fires going up there atop which they boiled oil, olive oil. And if someone was insistent on causing a problem down below, through those arches, they could pour down the boiling oil on the troublemakers down below, and that had a tendency to discourage them a fair amount. You can imagine. Now, if on the other hand, someone did gain entrance through a door or a window at the first or second level, then the royals could go up into the clock tower, the bell tower, it's one and the same, and up in the very top, the place is designed in the same way. And in fact, now we have a better picture of it. You can see that much of it has fallen away now, tragically. The tower was more often used as a place of imprisonment than it was a place of security or a safe room, as we might call it. You know, many of the homes today, the wealthy families, have a safe room. If someone tries to break in, if your alarm goes off, folks go to this room that is uh, more solidly built than others and is supposed to be doubly safe and many of them even bulletproof and mom and the kids go inside and lock the door. Well, the safe room here was way up in the bell tower. I want to talk to you now about the most famous prisoner ever held in that tower. His name was Girolamo Savonarola. Now Savonarola was a pastor and a very dedicated pastor and a very serious student of the Word of God. And he loved particularly the writings of the Apostle Paul, the Romans, the Galatians, the letter to the Ephesians, where righteousness by faith was so clearly taught, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And this pastor began to share these ideas and these teachings with the folks, and it was like pouring water on dry ground. The folks coming out of the Dark Ages hadn't heard anything like this. They had been taught for centuries and also had their forebears that you gain God's pleasure by going on pilgrimages, by lighting candles, by flagellating your back, by on occasion walking on glass in your sandals. And when Pastor Savonarola began to teach that righteousness was by trusting in what Jesus had already done for us. When he began to explain salvation by grace and justification in Jesus, the folk came to hear him en masse. What he was teaching now was contrary to what the church at the time was teaching. And the church and the state were one and the same. This was long before laws against church and state being joined together. And many of the countries of the world, of course, today still do not have any such laws. We're fortunate that here in the United States we believe still strongly in the separation of church and state. Savonarola was threatened. You must stop your preaching the righteousness of Jesus. And Savonarola said, it's the good news. It's the gospel. How can you tell me to stop? And so he continued to share. And there long the officers came and arrested him. There was a farce of a trial here. And then because he refused to change his ways, he was taken up into the top of the tower. And we're going to go up there in just a little bit. And there a cell had been prepared for him. It did have one window out of which he had a southern view. And there he was held for years and years and years with no appeal. But after so many years, he was called down for an examination. And the judge said to him, Pastor, I am willing to let you go home today. But you must promise me that you'll stop talking about the righteousness of Jesus. And Savonarola said, I have no desire at all to be a firebrand or, or to proselytize or to cause a disruption within the church. That's not my aim, not my plan. But what if folks come and ask me about the righteousness of Jesus? 
Surely you can't expect me to say that I don't know or I can't tell you or any such thing as that. And they simply said to him, I'm warning you, be very careful. Be very careful. We'll finish that story of Savonarola after we just for a moment look inside the chapel. This is where the Medici who had arrested Savonarola worshipped and it is made lovely by some of the most precious marble in all of the world. Italy not only produces still today some of the finest, some of the most expensive marble, but it also still today provides the finest marble workmen and tile setters, I guess we might call them in our language, in our setup today. Well, <clears throat> out in front of the chapel, in front of the palace, there is a monument in the pavement today about the end of Pastor Savonarola, and here's the end of his story. He was released and allowed to go home after the warning, you must stop talking about the righteousness of Christ. And as soon as it was announced that he was released, the people came from every direction you can imagine, hungry more to hear about the righteousness of Christ, and Savonarola began to share and crowds came and grew and so he was arrested again taken again up into the tower but only for a short while one day the soldiers went stomping up the staircase and into his little cell where they strangled him to death and then dragged his body bumpity bump down the staircase and out in front where the people had gathered and there they burned his body and where that happened, there is today a monument, as I mentioned, with some very kind words about Pastor Girolamo Savonarola, and this in his memory on the spot where he was burned. Many, many years later, other pastors, Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox, Huss, would find not only spiritual direction, not only theological guidance, but also courage and strength from the example of Girolamo Savonarola. And so I would say to each of us tonight, whether our Christian background is from some branch of Protestantism or from the Roman Catholic Church, I believe each of us owes a debt of gratitude to Pastor Girolamo Savonarola. And if ever you're in Florence, you be sure to go to this spot because in many ways it's sacred. We're now up in the little room where Savonarola was held and, and that was his view. He had a really wonderful view of the bell tower of the second largest cathedral in the world. We're going to just put the camera out with the wide angle lens. We see again the coloration, the configuration of the city and right in the center, our next stop. And this is, by the way, the best picture you're going to get of this lovely large cathedral, the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. I mentioned earlier that it is the second largest Catholic cathedral in the world, but it is the third largest cathedral. The largest cathedral in all of the world is the Cathedral of St. Peter inside the Vatican, where we're going to visit in a few evenings. I'm going to take you right inside the Pope's home and into the Sistine Chapel where the Popes are elected. I'm going to take you down the main nave of St. Peter's, which is longer than two football fields end to end, to give you just a little bit of a feel for the size. So that's the largest cathedral in the world, St. Peter's in the Vatican. The second largest cathedral is the Cathedral of St. Paul in the city of London, and we had a brief glimpse of it our first night together here. We visited London, if you'll recall. But that's an Anglican cathedral. You see, the Church of England owns that one, built uh, by the direction of Christopher Wren. That makes this one then the third largest cathedral, but the second largest Catholic cathedral. It is made out of a very diverse combination of colors of marble. <clears throat> the dominant color and the largest section is made of Carrera marble, the Carrera Quarry or mine is only just a short distance, for just short miles from here. And I think it's the most beautiful marble in all the world still. 
a white Carrera marble. And then there is a hot pink marbling that is used for trim along with kind of a dark green. Now, generally, we would not think of putting those colors together. Probably, if a lady wore a, a suit and a purse with those combinations, someone would say that, uh, that they clashed, I suppose. But, but here, somehow, it fits. It really does fit. Now, we're going to back away a little bit and give you a feel for the size and the style. The architecture, for your interest's sake, is called Tuscan Romanesque. Kind of a combination of Tuscany, where we are here, and the Roman style of architecture. And you can see the beauty. And oh, by the way, be reminded that this thing was built about a thousand years ago by men with crude hand tools. And you see the statues up above the high above the entry doors. Well, look down toward the doors. There are three main doors, one on the left over here that you'll see, and one over on the right, and then one right in the very center. This is the main door that gains you access to the main nave. That's where the folks go in to worship. We can see where the folks are waiting to go inside. Let's look at the main door. There it is. There's the top of the door right up there. And down at the bottom of the screen, there are the heads of the people waiting to go inside. I've, I guess, never felt much smaller or insignificant than when I stepped inside for the first time, this massive church. It is so huge, and it is so very, very lovely. Now, <clears throat> there are three buildings here that comprise the church complex. This is the main, of course, the cathedral. Next to that is the campanile or the bell tower. And then <clears throat> when we turn around 180 degrees, we see another building separate of the part, but a part of the complex. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the baptistry named in the honor of St. John the Baptist. Some very important men have been baptized inside that baptistry, and I'll just take a moment to mention one of them for you. His name was Dante. Dante Alighieri was baptized inside this baptistry when he was just a young person. And it was Dante, you remember from reading in your high school literature, who wrote the Divine Comedy, and a portion of that is called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And Dante would represent God as vengeful and angry and waiting for the least excuse to drop folks, his children, into the tar pits of hell where they would roast and burn and fry forever and ever. Tragically, Dante's theology was passed down into the church and down through the ages. It is my considered opinion that Dante Alighieri has done more to defile the character of our Father God than any one other single person. I want you to take a close-up of the doors of the baptistry. There was a man by the name of Ghiberti who was commissioned at the time of the construction of the cathedral and the baptistry to design the entry doors. Ghiberti was a gifted artist. He could draw, he could sculpt, but his main gift, it seemed, was working with brass and with bronze. He was able to take a sheet of metal, brass, bronze, or a combination thereof, and begin to shape it and fashion it until it became almost three-dimensional. In other words, the figures out in the front of his design would stand out sometimes six, seven inches from those of the background. So we're going to move in for a close-up of these doors, the doors of the baptistry. They tell the story of the history of God's children, the Jews, and uh, about their deliverance from Egypt, and about the crossing of the Red Sea. Here we see them doing just that. Now, these frames, ladies and gentlemen, are a bit larger than three feet square. And again, be reminded, they're done out of one piece of metal. That's called base relief, for your interest's sake. And these bronze pieces were here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But because of pollution and, and acid rain and all that sort of thing, they began to show some wear. And so only just a few months ago, they were taken down and replaced with copies that had been made from forms taken from them, beautiful copies out of the same material, and the copies now replace the originals, and the copies are covered over with a waterproof sort of a plastic material, all right? 
Now, here's the really good news. Copies of these doors are going to be displayed in a few months over in Seattle, Washington. And I'm telling you folks, it's worth the drive to go from here to see them. And if you log on to National Geographic or some such source, or just look for the doors of, of Ghiberti, you will find when they're going to be over in Seattle. I think it's going to be quite soon now, but I'm not certain of the date. They're going to display them here in the three major cities, I believe, and Seattle happens to be one of them. The doors of the baptistry. Let's look at one other, shall we? Here is the depiction of the Queen of Sheba coming over to Solomon's temple, and the King James Bible says she was greatly impressed by the ascent. The New Translations say by the staircase that went up to the temple. And one of these nights, we'll have a look at what's left of that. And you'll notice now again how these figures stand out from the background. And, and you would just think that they had been made separately and then placed there individually, but they were not. We're down on the Arno River now. Framing our picture through one bridge to the second bridge. The second bridge is the one that we're going to spend some time uh, talking about and, and regarding just a little bit. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the oldest bridge in the world. Therefore, it has been given that name, Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge. Now, <clears throat> if ever you have been to Venice, and you remember a few evenings we went, if you were here with me, we went to Venice and we went down the Grand Canal and we saw there a, a bridge that was sort of V-shaped, kind of like an arch, and it was called the Rialto, and I told you it was built in 1588. That is the second oldest bridge in the world, but this one is older by more than 200 years. 1345, this bridge was built. Now, <clears throat> this is the only bridge across the Arno River for miles and miles in either direction that was not blown up during the time of World War II by the Allies, the Americans and the British fighting against the central power, the Allied powers of Germany, because this was a main communication line, you see, between Hitler in the north and Mussolini down south. And so they blew up the bridges across the Arno, but they saved this one for two reasons. It is so narrow that you couldn't, certainly couldn't get a tank across it. You couldn't drive a jeep through it and you could not march soldiers in any number. And so it was not a threat in that way, but more importantly, I'm sure, because of its antiquity, it's the oldest bridge in all the world. Now I want to point out a couple of things here to you. Let's look up toward the top. Maybe the next picture, yes, this one is even more clear. Look up across the top of the bridge there, and you'll see windows, and those windows have bars across them, and those windows give light to a very, very special sidewalk. I guess that's the best way to say it. The Medici family had their palace on one side of the river, and they had their home, their places of government, I should better say, on the other side. The home was on one side, and the governmental office was on the other side of the river. In order to get to work, you had to cross the river. In order to get back home, you crossed the river, and they had political enemies, as we mentioned earlier. We talked about the design and the architecture of the palace. It would not be safe for a royal to walk down with the commoners and down in the street, especially in a narrow and confined place. And so they built this special sidewalk so that the Medici could cross the river in safety. What's on the bridge today? Well, I'll tell you. There is a Jewish family that does gold jewelry they're said to be the finest goldsmiths in all the world. And I can tell you ladies <laughs> that their jewelry is very, very expensive. And the main shop is here on the bridge. And when they make a piece of jewelry, they mark it with their family mark and with the old bridge mark, Ponte Vecchio. And they say that as soon as it is stamped in that way, it has instant antique value. Now that sounds to me like a contradiction of terms, but nonetheless, you would pay twice or perhaps three times as much for the same piece here on the if made on the bridge as you would for the piece that was made a block or two on either side but if you're like me you probably just soon put new tires on the car anyway <laughs> yeah well we're going to stop now at the gallery of the academy and we're going to see what i believe to be some of the most beautiful marble carving in all of the world 
I can't tell you who's done this one, but I can tell you that it's a solid piece of marble. And you notice the folds of the dress and the delicacy. We're going to move inside the main theater and take a look at Michelangelo's David. Standing there on a raised stone platform some 30 feet is Michelangelo's David. Now let me tell you a bit about the background. Out at the Carrera Quarry, there was an accident. The miners were taking off a large chunk of marble when a piece on the end slivered off. It was icicle-like, long and narrow, and they felt that it would be a waste, but Michelangelo said, no, give it to me. He happened at the time to be about age 24. They took the marble downtown and there was a tent built around it and this young man began to chisel and chisel and chisel and two years later he had the unveiling. Michelangelo's David, perhaps the most famous marble carving in all this world. Now you'll notice that he kept the one arm tight to the side and the other arm that holds the sling is near to the body as well. But we're going to move in, you and I, for some close-up. I want you to look at the hand there. And you see the cords that open and close the fingers. And you look at your own hand and you see exactly the same thing. And then we're going to move over to the neck and we see the great cords that turn the head. And we're going to move up this cord and right there we see a blood vessel. And we just have to pinch ourselves to be reminded that this is done with a man with a hammer and a chisel. Amazing. How was he able to bring out such detail? And by the way, if you're ever looking at art, the finest art is classified by its detail. If you're looking at a sculpture, if you're looking at a bronze, if you're looking at a cloisonne, if you're looking at a Dresden piece of something of humanity, if the fingers are webbed together, that's not the finest. But if the detail is fine, if the fingers are separated, if the lace is individual, then it's the finest stuff. And so we find it here. How was he able to bring out this detail? Before ever he began to paint or sculpt, he had been a student of the human anatomy. He had been a part of the dissecting of several cadavers. He knew all of the muscular system and the circulatory system, and he was able somehow to make it come to life in stone. Here are a couple of graves, a couple of sarcophagi inside the, the uh, gallery of the academy, and uh, male and female figures, and one is day and the other is night, and that is the tomb, by the way, of Lorenzo de Medici. Now our final stop is this cathedral, Santa Croce the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. We're not going to go inside because it's not elaborate and it's not terribly large. We are going to go over into a crypt in just a little bit to see one place of burial. But this one, for my mind, is important because of four men who are buried inside. To say that these men were contemporaries wouldn't be exactly correct, but to say that to the large degree their lives overlap would be correct. One of the men buried inside is Machiavelli. Niccolo Machiavelli was only about 20 years of age when he wrote a book entitled The Prince. And it was his own design for the way cities and states ought to be governed. And in his writing he said, what is important is political expediency. I think that's the best way to say it. And he promoted the idea that the end justifies the means. And it's all right to be involved in little immorality. It's all right to cheat a little. It's all right to lie a lot as long as you have the best political result in mind. And it seems to my mind that that has caught on in a lot of political circles today. Did it ring any bells in your head? Yeah, that whole idea is called today Machiavellian attitudes. Machiavelli is buried inside. And then another that we have spoken of Michelangelo Bonarotti is buried inside. This is not his tomb, but it is a tomb of a contemporary in a sense. This is the tomb of Galileo Galilei. Galileo was born in the same year that Michelangelo died, and they're both buried inside. And then the fourth man of importance is Dante Alighieri, of whom we spoke a bit earlier. Dante is buried inside. If you folks haven't read a couple of good biographies of Michelangelo and Galileo, certainly, you need to do that. 
Galileo didn't invent, but he perfected the telescope and made it a working tool and traced the movements of the heavenly bodies with an accuracy that still stuns astronomers today. I thank you for traveling with me. And now to our subject, the prayer never answered yet. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew's Gospel chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. The context is this. The disciples have obviously heard our Lord Jesus pray oft times, and they were impressed by his prayer and by his style. And so they asked him, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And Jesus did. And we now refer to his teaching in this area as the Lord's Prayer. And I want to read just a couple of verses. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Jesus said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now you tell me what it says. Thy will be done where? On earth, On earth as it is in heaven. That is the prayer, my dears, not answered yet. Lord, could your will, your way, your love be demonstrated daily here on earth? Could your kingdom come? Could people love one another? Could they treat folks decently? Could they train their children in the right way? Could they live a healthful life? Could your kingdom come now? Here on earth, it hasn't happened yet. I'm sorry to have to report to you. The world news in the last three days. I've taken a couple of notes here. They found a baby again in the dumpster day before yesterday. It's getting so folks throw their kids away with the morning trash and the kitchen garbage. And not very many hours prior to that, there was a guy who got angry with his wife over divorce settlement and said, I'll get even with you. And he took the kids and threw them into the bay and off of the bridge. A couple of days later, another guy, evidently getting the same idea, decided he would shoot his three kids to death to get even with his wife. And he did that, and then he killed himself. And then you remember the tragedy of just yesterday in the fast food store. A guy goes into the restroom and for no reason at all pulls a semi-automatic pistol and shoots six people and then takes his own life. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not yet. I want to read you. A little something here but before I read it I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 verse 12 we've alluded to Matthew chapter 24 and Luke 17 21 so many many times in the last several evenings because they go together they're referred to by theologians these days by the way as the Olivet discourse the disciples have asked us uh, asked their Lord rather what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world and he said it's going to be like this and this and this and this and then he gives in verse 12 this little bit of information. Chapter 24. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax how? Did it get better and better? No. Natural love shall wax worse and worse and colder and colder still. I want to read you something from a man who said it I think better than I could ever say it he said love's growing cold in the last days is really the root of not only religious persecution but racial bigotry as well the breakdown of the family unit in our century is directly related we're stunned not only by bizarre crimes where parents and children murder one another but by growing the mo growing multitude of sad-eyed boys and girls who are mournfully adrift between separated parents some physically and mentally abused some whose faces stare at us for perhaps the last time from the milk cartons and the newspaper mailings he said selfishness is today completely suffocating God's love. Some say that the coming of Jesus, which I believe will finally bring an end to this kind of tragedy, and finally will bring the answer to that prayer, Thy will be done. The coming of Jesus, some say, is, um, is an invisible thing. It happens in the heart. When you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, that's the second coming of Jesus. 
But there have been others who said, no, no, Jesus comes when you die. When a believer dies, that's the second coming. And then there is another and growing group that has say, have said that, that he's already here in a literal way. They came in 1914 or 1917. Others say he's never coming. It's only an allegory. It's never going to happen. It's just a kind of a pious platitude that's dished out to those that are hurting and suffering at times of accident and tragedy and illness and disease and death. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not the only ones, you and I, who believe that something has to happen. And I'm going to enlarge upon that in just a little bit. But I first want to put into your minds another passage that's very directly related to the inhumanity, one man to another, parents to children, children to parents and grandparents. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, there our Lord Jesus talked about the war and rumor of war, and we alluded to this on another evening. Uh, but I want to read this to you tonight. It's a recent study. It suggests that we travel in our minds eastward. We go from Iran to the Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, and then we go to India with its racial turmoil. And then we move to the ravaged countries of Laos and Cambodia and eventually to Vietnam. We go to the Koreas, and then we move on south to the Philippines, that ticking time bomb. And then we're going to head across the Pacific to the troubled Central and South Americas, across the Atlantic, then to Ireland, down to South Africa, over into Libya, where there has been the export of terrorism. And we arrive again, finally, in the Middle East, where the strife is as complex as it is implacable. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, said Jesus. How very true, says the author all around the world. And then in addition to that, as we also mentioned on another evening, there is the ethnicity, the fighting of gangs in the neighborhoods because of this color against that color or this neighborhood against that other neighborhood. And so the folks of the world have known, some for a long while have felt that something is going to happen. And while there is the idea out there in the secular world that only religious fanatics believe in a literal second coming of Jesus, I thought that I would just share with you some of the other perspectives from other points of view. Let's talk about the Native American. The idea of end time belief has been held by Native Americans for many, many years. A Sioux medicine man by the name of Ogallala said that the world would grow out of balance and natural disasters like floods, fires, and earthquakes would in the final days increase. And then he said, there will come a white buffalo. When the white buffalo is born, there will soon come a return of balance and harmony and spiritual awakening in the world. And some of the tribal leaders still today, I'm reading, some tribal leaders still today feel that this may well have begun when a white buffalo was born in 1994. Interesting. The Hopi Indians. All right, a little nearer to home perhaps for some. Several Hopi tribal leaders have prophesied that the coming of the white man to their part of the world was the signal of the end times. And they began to say and teach that about 250 years ago. And then there's the Judaic perspective. The Talmud states that the world as we know it today will last only 6,000 years. And by the way, in their calendar, it is now 5766. And that relates to our calendar, year 2000. And, um, and 38, only just a few years away is the way they believe about it all. And then there's the Islamic perspective, and we could go on and on and on. But to those who suggest that it's just an illusion, it's only just a symbol, it's a metaphor, I'm here to say to you tonight once again that it is indeed a reality. And it is not only the blessed hope, it's the world's only hope, as we've said also on several prior occasions. Our Lord Jesus in an upper room to his very best friends gave this promise. They were gathered to celebrate for the last time the Lord's Supper and to institute to celebrate rather for the last time the Passover feast and then to put in its place the Lord's Supper. And in that context, while his 12 best friends are gathered around him, Jesus says, I'm going to have to leave you. Where I'm going, you can't come. Not now, not yet. And their hearts are broken. They've just come to love him totally and trust him explicitly completely and they begin to show their concern lord why please don't desert us please don't and into this troubled environment jesus speaks words of promise 
John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. And I read not long ago in my study for this subject that this verse has been learned by more children in church and Sunday school and elsewhere than perhaps any other single verse. John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Jesus in the upper room said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my... Now tell me, where? Somewhere out in outer space? Somewhere among the clouds, in some ethereal place, in some misty, nebulous sort of a notion in your mind. No, in my Father's house, there are many mansions, many rooms, say other translations. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to go to get one ready for you. And if I go, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 through 29, and I want you A students to write it down, and before you go to sleep tonight, go home and read it because it's so very, very encouraging. But the Apostle Paul would say to those who want to suggest that heaven and the earth made new is a metaphor, he would say this, if in this life only we have hope, then we are of all men most miserable. If this is all we have, if this is it, if this party is all that we're entitled to, then we're of all men most miserable. The Bible refers to our Lord Jesus as the paradigm of resurrection. He is the first fruit, says the King James Bible. That means he is the supreme example. And we could then let our minds be reminded of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. When on that resurrection Sunday the stone was rolled away, did Jesus come out as some kind of a ghost or a vapor or an essence or kind of a, a metaphor sort of? No, he came out a real man, a real man. Mary from Magna, the last to leave the cross, is the first at the open tomb. And when she gets there in the early morning before the sunlight really has arrived, and she looks through her tears and sees that the stone is rolled away and her heart is broken and she moves nearer and looks inside and sees his body is gone. And she's thinking, will they never let him alone? Will they torture and torment him always? They tortured him during his life. They won't let him have peace in death. Is there nothing sacred any longer? And then through her tears she looks. And it's becoming a bit more lighted in the garden. And she sees someone whom she believes to be the gardener. And so she calls out, sir, if you've taken his body somewhere... Tell, tell me where you've taken them, and I'll take care of them. I've always admired the, uh, the faith uh, of little Mary. You just tell me where his body is, and I'll take care of it now. And who was it? It was Jesus. And he said to her, Mary, Mary. And she recognized him by his voice. And she ran to him. And the picture in the New Testament is from John's Gospel, chapter 19 and chapter 20, that she fell down and threw her arms around his ankles. He was never going to let him out of her sight again. And Jesus said, you can't hang on to me, Mary. I have not yet ascended. You can't hold me here. I have work yet to do. He came out of the grave, a real man with a real body. He appeared later that day to the disciples. And, and there was one who was absent, you remember. Thomas, the man from Missouri, had to be showed. <laughs> and when the other disciples said, boy, you missed something wonderful. Jesus, he's not dead. He just stopped by. And Thomas said, there's no way. There's no way. That was some kind of a ghost, some kind of a spook that came by here. And so a week later, Jesus stopped by again. And this time, Thomas was home. And Thomas still refused and backed away. And Don't come near me. And Jesus said, grow up, Thomas. <laughs> Stop this nonsense. Come and put your finger into my wounds. And then Jesus said, a spirit, a ghost, doesn't have a flesh and body as you see that I have. Jesus, 40 days later, ascended up into the skies. And the Bible says a cloud received him out of the sight. And you read this in Acts chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11. And then an angel stood beside some of the folks that were watching and said, You men of Galilee, why are you gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus that you've seen going to heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. He went up into heaven and he's coming back to take his children to the places there that he has made. And then the prayer will be answered. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I've been asked oftentimes, where is heaven? Where is it? 
Is it do we win outer space or is it where is that? What is this? I'm going to give you several answers as regards the New Testament language is when it speaks about heaven. And for one of time now, I'm going to have to insist that you just take notes and it'll all be on the taping, of course. I want to allude to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. There the Apostle Paul talks about a vision that he had. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first four verses. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven. Whether I was there in my mind and vision or whether my body was literally taken, I'm not sure, but I know I was there. The third heaven. Now, it's a matter of simple logic. It is a matter of, um, of deduction that if there is a third, there must of necessity be also a first and a second. And so let me then give you some of the ideas. The first heaven, I believe, is the aerial heaven. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 17 gives a suggestion. That's where the birds fly, up there in the atmosphere. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, the three degree, degrees of glory. I don't want anyone to, to get the mistaken notion that I'm suggesting some kind of spiritual progression. But the atmosphere, the, where, where pollution is, and, and where the rain comes from, where the birds fly. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, tell us about that uh, part of the heavens is called the stellar heavens then. That's where the stars are. And, and so that, I believe, is the second heaven. And the third heaven, as is alluded in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, and also in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, speaks about paradise. And it tells us that that's where God's throne is. And that's where also the tree of life is, in paradise. And so I see then the three heavens the Apostle Paul talked about. There is the atmospheric heaven where the birds fly. There is the starry heaven where the, the stars shine down upon it. And then there is paradise where God's throne is and where Jesus is going to come and take us to when he comes in his second coming. Moses and Elijah were taken to the third heaven. Moses was resurrected to represent and to symbolize those that will be taken out of the graves when Jesus comes in his second coming. Elijah, on the other hand, was translated. That's a Bible word. That means that he did not die. The Bible says he was taken up in a chariot of fire. I was talking to one lady not so very long ago about the realities of heaven and how wonderful it's going to be and, and how we're going to build mansions and grow gardens. And she said this, the thing that delights me is to just think there'll be no more trailer houses. <laughs> no more trailer houses. You know, permanence, that was her idea. Finally, permanence. It's true we're going to have a home in the city built by our Lord Jesus. It's also true that we're going to go out into the countryside and build our own according to our own design and our own plan. And that's why folks sing that lovely spiritual, plenty good room, plenty good room in my father's house, plenty good room in the kingdom. The size of the city is enormous. The book of Revelation tells us, and when you compute it into our ways of measuring, it's about 375 miles square. Some have suggested it's about the same size as is the state of Oregon, 141,000 square miles. I have a buddy with whom I was talking not long ago, a buddy that I appreciate so very much for his lifestyle. He graduated from Loma Linda University with a degree in dentistry and uh, then went to California to practice where he could have made tons of money but got disgusted by the rat race and the lifestyle and the competition and the way others were doing. And so he and his wife went to Africa as missionaries. And they spent the rest of their working time there and still from time to time go there. And not long ago, he and I were visiting. We graduated uh, from high school at the same time. And I said to him, George, sometimes I look at the, uh, the lack uh, in, in my life and, and what I haven't provided for my family and and by the way, my friend George is living in a mobile home. And I said, I look around at some of the others that graduate with us and they have big bank accounts and beautiful homes. He said, that's all right, Lyle. He said, we have a friend who's building us a mansion up there. Yeah. A mansion? Fine. But I want to tell you folks tonight, Lyle's going to be happy and satisfied if Jesus will just let me in the door. 
Just let me inside, Lord. Just give me a corner there somewhere. And I shall be forever satisfied. David, you remember, in Psalm 84, verse 10, said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. That means a servant. I'd rather be the guy that opens and closes the door in the house of God than to dwell in fancy places with wicked folks. Just let me inside. Imagine it now. In the earth made new. Our Lord's going to take us to heaven. We're going to be there with him for a thousand years. And we're going to talk about the millennium in a few evenings. And it does matter what you believe. And be sure that you're here when we study passage, uh, Revelation chapter 20 in that passage. Make sure that you're here. But we're going to spend a thousand years in heaven where Jesus is going to prepare the mansions. And then the holy city is going to come down as we've read again and again, Revelation 21. I, John, saw the new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And when the prayer of Jesus is answered, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then there'll be no more hospitals. Thank God for the doctors and the nurses, and there are many here. And I've told you nurses especially how I appreciate you and how I love you because I have two of my kids that are nurses Thank God for hospitals and for nurses. And there's a necessity of jails and prisons and even for reform schools, but not any longer when the prayer is answered. Not when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. No longer the cemeteries. Don't you want to go to heaven? Don't you want to go? I'm ready right now. Some have the mistaken notion that there are only 144,000 that are going to go there. And, um, and, and I don't have any great burden about that. I really don't believe it in that way. I don't care very much as long as I'm one of them. <laughs> Just let me in the door, Lord. I looked in the mirror not long ago. And I saw someone I didn't know. Since our boy died, my face has caved in. And I, half jokingly and half seriously, had a little conversation with a plastic surgeon. Could you help me? And he half jokingly said, uh, well, Al, I wouldn't know where to start or where to stop. He said, besides that, if I gave you my part free, you still couldn't afford it. I said, well, I was afraid you'd say that. Well, he said, don't feel bad, Lyle. He said, keep your chins up, all three of them. <laughs> One day I'm going to be changed. One day the face I see in the mirror more and more is a stranger to me. More and more I see myself becoming a man I never thought I'd be. You go through the airport these days, and they put you through trials and tribulations, and, and you've got to go through all of those machines that beep no matter what, and, and uh, you have to undress and take off your shoes and, and some of the rest of your clothes. And they have cameras now, they tell me, that are taking pictures of you, but they're real careful not to let just everybody see them. That's good for me. And I went through one such not so very long ago, and I was complaining a little bit. And the person on the other end where I was getting my shoe said, well, sir, we didn't check the bags under your eyes. I said, that's not funny. <laughs> that is not funny. But one day I'm going to be changed. One day. Oh, what a day. I saw on a television program a couple of days ago, a medical program, two little girls, twins they were, born with some serious health problems. And they were both deaf and they were both completely blind. And I've thought much about those little girls. Never heard a human voice, never seen a human face. 
But one day soon, there's going to be the blowing of a trumpet. There's going to be the shout of an angel. Awake ye that sleep in the dust. There's going to be the call of Jesus. It's time to get up. It's getting up time. And the graves are going to open. And imagine those two little girls. Their ears are going to be unstopped. And their eyes are going to see. And the first voice they hear is the voice of Jesus. And the first face they see is the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day that will be. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let your prayer be answered. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now let us pray. It's pretty tough here, Lord. You know that. You've been through it. But you have promised that one day soon it's going to be much better. And it's not just some make-believe notion or idea. You've gone to build a real home in a real place where you're going to take your real children to spend a real eternity with no sickness, suffering, sorrow, or heartache. And then as my daughter-in-law has said so many times lately, I have so much to tell Terry. We're homesick, Lord, homesick for heaven. Seems we can't wait. We're longing to enter Zion's pearly gate where there's never a heartache, never a care. We long for our home over there. Come quickly.